end with weight loss. Regular fasting has extraordinary health benefits, including reducing your risk of diabetes and dementia. It can even make you smarter. Ross Coulthard went to the UK to meet the man behind the 5-2 revolution and went on his own journey with impressive results. For the next week or so, I'm to be a 5-2 lab rat. What are these tests going to show me? What are you trying to find out? Well, hopefully they're not going to tell you if you've got any major problems. Your health, your future is in your own hands. You can do something about it. This is one of the easiest ways you will ever encounter to lose weight. Hey, hey, good! I do genuinely believe that. While everyone else gets to eat, I'll be starving myself. Ah, oh, the smells are just driving me crazy. It's torture. Food, glorious food, and I can't touch a bit of it. Scientifically testing the notion that regular fasting is incredibly good for you. It's the only thing that's ever been shown to extend life. So much of what I've always taken for granted about food will be turned on its head. Well, what I tend to say is to people, you know, actually we've been giving rubbish dietary advice for years. I've also learned that all those years sweating in the gym have probably been a waste of time. I'm not telling you you need to go to the gym. All you need to do is three minutes of intense exercise a week. <laughs> I'm going to go find somewhere quiet where there's no food. I wish Michael Mosley was here. I would give him the biggest hug. He's transformed my life. Now, I'm hoping he's going to transform me. Dr Michael Mosley is the BBC science presenter credited with discovering 5-2. Hello. Michael Mosley. Hello, I'm Ross Coulter. Please come in. A very hungry Ross Coulter. <laughs> From his home in the English countryside, the father of four with a background in science and medicine... Right, keep working, everyone. Keep working. ...is leading a revolution, championing the surprising benefits of fasting. I'll bet there are thousands of middle-aged men and women watching this right now thinking, oh, God, not another diet story. <laughs> yes. No, I, I, you know, I despise diets. Uh, before all this happened, um, I had looked at diets. I'd seen my father struggle with. He did the working men's diet. He did the drinker's diet, the businessman diet. He tried everything. He failed on all of them. And so um, everything I had read told me that diets don't work. Michael didn't set out to discover a diet. He didn't even think he had a weight problem. As a child, he was skinny. As an adult, a little heavy around the middle, but nothing to worry about, or so he thought. His father, however, always struggled with his weight and the problems that caused him. He died at the age of 73 and he was diabetic, he had heart failure, he was going demented and he also had um, prostate cancer. When did you first realise that you were headed the same way, unless you did something about it? It was really, I went to see a doctor um, about something completely different. I was worried about a sort of mole I had, and she did a routine blood test, and she said, I have some very bad news for you, that you're a diabetic. We're going to have to put you on medication. And your cholesterol, by the way, is also uh, sky high at the moment. I've discovered that my body is not the lean, long-lived machine I would like it to be. <laughs> third of your body's fat. Thank you <laughs> for making that point so emphatically. Yeah! Worried by the diagnosis, Michael went searching for solutions and along the way filmed his journey of discovery for the BBC. Right, it is now 10.30 at night and I am hungry. To save his life and have a healthy future, he first had to look back. The story begins in the Dust Bowls of America during the 1930s. There was a terrible drought, food was scarce, and the whole country was in the grips of the Great Depression. Now, you would imagine in such difficult times that life expectancy would fall, but in fact, it rose. During the darkest years of Great Depression, 1929 to 1933, life expectancy increased by a remarkable six years. 
on the face of it, that sounds very surprising. But Michael's own experience was that his own well-fed lifestyle was harming his life expectancy. During his documentary, he put himself through a battery of tests. Luigi's face tells me that what I'm about to hear is not good news. The abdominal fat is around 30%. Abdominal fat is really the bad guy. The higher the abdominal fat, the higher the, the risk of developing type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, no doubt about it. It is also a risk factor for cancer. So basically, your cardiometabolic profile, it's, it's not good. What many of us laugh off as harmless belly fat is actually a killer. And don't be fooled. You can look thin on the outside and still be fat on the inside. He didn't look overweight because he's quite long-limbed and it just, you wouldn't, I mean, started to have a little bit of spreading around the middle, but, you know, a lot of middle-aged men do. It was all coating my internal organs and there's a thing called metabolic syndrome and I bet a hell of a lot of Australians have metabolic syndrome and they don't know it. You can be apparently skinny and still have it and you still have your internal organs coated with these layers of fat and it's doing all sorts of bad things. The more Michael investigated the science, the more he came to believe in the possible benefits of intermittent fasting. But the proof would be in the pudding, or in his case, the lack of it. OK, I decided I'm good to um, try this fast, which is going to be a three and a half day fast. And all I'm going to have is lots of water, black tea, and one 50 calorie cup of soup a day. Now, oh God, I have never done things quite like this before, so I imagine it's going to be really tough. Reasonably sure. What researchers say is that we are descended from a long life of cave men and cave women, if you like. So the tradition of feast and fast is built into our genes. Um, that's how it is. Um, so fasting, or at least involuntary fasting, going without food for periods of time would have been incredibly normal. And that is incredibly abnormal now. Oh, my delicious miso soup here. Give a bit of a stir with the hotel pen because there's no other cutlery around. Mmm. Health. 25 calories worth. What they know from the science is that you fast, everybody fasts broadly overnight. You stop eating at about 8 o'clock in the evening, you probably don't eat again until 7 o'clock the next morning. What's happening in your body when that is going down is that your body switches from essentially go-go mode into repair mode. Uh, your proteins start to be broken down, old cells get cleared out, the junk goes. Now, as soon as you start eating again, that process goes into reverse. So when you go without food for even 10 hours, repair starts to take place. If you go without food for 24 hours, 36 hours, more repair occurs. Is it the case that until comparatively recently in human history, we didn't eat three square meals a day? Absolutely. And in fact, until relatively recently, uh, we ate a maximum of three. You know, when I was a child, my mum would say, don't eat between meals. Now we eat six, seven times a day because we snack. When we eat a lot, we produce more of a growth hormone called IGF-1, which increases activity in our cells. They divide and create new ones. But fasting lowers the levels of IGF-1 meaning fewer cells are created. Instead, the body focuses on repairing existing cells. The proof is inside this mouse, which has been genetically engineered with low levels of IGF-1. This little mice, mouse right here holds the world record for longevity extension in a mammal. Oh, right, that is remarkable. It is the periods without food which your body has the opportunity to do the spring cleaning because the rest of the time it just wants to get on with life. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and the good news is with your fasting diet you drop to almost half. At so the end of his fast, Michael's results were extraordinary. I have massively decreased my risk of a whole range of age-related diseases. The big question in my mind at the moment is can I do 
fasting once a month for however long it takes. And that's how he came up with the 5-2 diet. He knew most of us would find lengthy fasts difficult. But again, science provided the solution. Evidence showing that even two days a week of minimal food intake can bring maximum benefits. The basics are that you eat normally five days a week, and then for two days a week, you cut your calories down to a quarter of their normal level. I'm extremely proud of myself. I, I, I look in the mirror now and I just think, I cannot believe this is my body. I can't believe I've, I have done this. John, do you want some fried rice? Gloria Puljak is a teacher and a mother of two who's become a 5-2 convert. Her battle with weight began after having children. I couldn't stop with, you know, a little bowl of chips. I had to eat my son's chips and I had to eat my daughter's leftovers. So it wasn't just my meal I was eating, I was eating leftovers as well. My arms were humongous. I didn't have a double chin. I, I, like, every time I'd turn, it was a triple chin. My stomach had dimples all over it, and no matter how, how many times I laid flat, I still had dimples on it. At her heaviest, Gloria weighed 82 kilos, and her blood sugar levels were dangerously high. Then she saw Michael's documentary, read his book, and tried 5-2. She's lost more than 20 kilos in a year, three dress sizes. She's also turned around her risk of diabetes, her blood sugar levels are now normal, much to the delighted surprise of her doctor. She said, I can't believe how healthy you are. You're the healthiest you've ever been, even before you had kids. So it, it, I just was, I just thank Michael for everything. We are all getting fatter, aren't we? We are, uh, and it's very striking particularly in the UK, the US, and Australia. Australia has been shooting up the obesity uh, ranks, as you well know, and I think you're probably about number four or number five at the moment. Uh, we're only number seven. The Americans have slipped down to number two behind Mexico. I have to say there will be a lot of Australians quite shocked to hear that they're fatter than Brits. Uh, they're fatter than Brits, but the New Zealanders are even fatter than them, so that uh, you're doing slightly better than your cousins across the water. Now here's something to make us think. Fasting may also make us smarter. We're finding by putting electrodes in the brain of animals that during fasting, their brain cells are more active. So we're actually cleverer when we're fasting. Yes, and that, again, if we go back to the evolutionary considerations, uh, it makes sense. If you haven't been able to find food, your brain better be functioning well. It dates back to when we were cavemen. So I'm a starving caveman. I'm hungry. Yeah. In order to catch food, I've got to be sharp and agile. Is it as simple as that? Exactly right. If you're not sharp and agile, you're not going to compete successfully. You're not going to get enough food to survive. Professor Matson's studies have also found that fasting increases the ability of mice to remember and learn and it decreases their risk of dementia. In the humans, all we can say is that there's some epidemiological data that suggests that uh, people who overeat are at risk for Alzheimer's disease. As I neared the end of my fast, there was one final tip from Michael Mosley about a little thing called exercise and how most of us are doing it wrong. So we've just past a lady and she's kind of jogging which is fair enough but unfortunately unless she puts in a few bursts unless she decides to try and sprint up this hill ahead of us it's probably not going to do her very much good I mean, it's better than nothing but it's not a fabulous but she's actually wasting her time pretty much unfortunately michael's view is that those hour-long gym workouts are 57 minutes wasted Instead, intense bursts of exercise, as little as three minutes a week, are the key to longevity. Go! I'm into this. Go! Three! We were descended from hunter-gatherers, and when you look at hunter-gatherers, what do they do? They have periods of feast and famine, and do they do lots of work out in the gym? No, they do not. Up a bloody hell, too! 
they have periods where they do quite a lot of walking, but in dispersed, they have short bursts where they're either running away from something or running to catch something. They have very, very short bursts, and our bodies seem to be designed for that. After the famine, but before the feast, came the results. How did my fast change me? Let's have a look. I'm 98.8 kilos. I was 104 and a half kilos. That's amazing. Wow, that's quite impressive, isn't it? Yeah, I'm pretty happy about that. Kilogram. Shall we check your blood pressure? And the good news didn't end there. My blood pressure and glucose levels had returned to normal. Before the fast, they'd been a little on the high side. Long term, I was risking type 2 diabetes. Not anymore. In a small way, my personal journey mirrors Michael Mosley's. I've gone from being somebody at high risk of diabetes and heart disease to somebody who's currently, you know, the last time I looked at the calculator, it said I was going to live to 90. The now immortal Roskul Tart reporting. Next, the one and only.